The New Realism by Morris Raphael Cohen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Footnote A Review of The New Realism Cooperative Studies in Philosophy by Edwin B. Holt, Walter T. Marvin, William Pepperell Montague, Ralph Barton Perry, Walter B. Pitkin, and Edward Gleason Spaulding. End footnote though the polemic spirit has for some time filled the air of philosophy the numerous marches and countermarches cannot be said to have proved decisive as the walls of philosophy refuse to fall at the mere flourish of trumpets there has been little change in the status quo everyone therefore interested in genuine philosophic progress will welcome this volume and its well-organized attempt to advance the position outlined in the platform unless however i am very much mistaken the authors of this book may be pleasantly or unpleasantly surprised at being welcomed by many idealists who will regard them not as hostile invaders but as much needed immigrants taking possession of the abandoned or undeveloped soil and rendering it fruitful for the common good perhaps the authors of this book may resent this attempt to minimize the importance of the destructive mission of their class consciousness but I think philosophers generally are more fortunate in delivering the positive burden of their own vision than in their denial of the vision of others. The polemic consciousness is not in any of its forms conducive to complete justice, and history is full of examples of philosophers, like Aristotle, attacking most vehemently those most closely related to them. It is indeed a wise philosopher who knows his own true opponent now neo-realism looks upon idealism as the great enemy because as a matter of fact the former movement originated in a reaction against such types of idealism as is embodied in bradley's appearance and reality and strong's why the mind has a body footnote the essence of idealism as that term has been used in philosophy literature art politics etc is that the structure of the universe justifies certain values called ideals and with that doctrine the authors of this book have no quarrel whatsoever they are fighting epistemological subjectivism but for some unaccountable reason they always call it idealism that this use of the word idealism involves unusual violence to the facts of history e g in the implication that an idealist like hegel is an epistemological subjectivist ought to be clear to all students of the history of philosophy but this is a minor matter if the sympathetic reader will simply substitute the word subjectivism whenever the authors use the word idealism End footnote. when however one disregards the accidental starting point and judges neo-realism by its fundamental tendency the opposition between realism and dualistic or psychologic pragmatism will be seen to be of far greater significance between a position which would regard everything in terms of the subject and a position which would regard everything as objective there may be little or no theoretic difference for the same laws or relations may hold between experiences as between independent reals i e the distinction between different classes of entities may be the same in the two systems between a view however which insists that the propositions of logic and mathematics are as real or objective i e independent of mind as those of physics and a view which denies to objects of thought the ontological status of objects of sense the issue is significant and it seems to me laden with momentous consequences i regard therefore the problem of the reality of universals the things of thought as the central question which this volume raises it is not then so much Berkeley's subjectivism about which there is considerable doubt as his nominalism that presents the significant alternative to the neo-realist position at any rate if professor marvin's paper proves its point the epistemological issue cannot be the fundamental one but must yield in fundamental importance to issues of fact or theories of being nominalism the denial of reality to relations abstractions etc is based on the conscious or unconscious assumption of the ancient dogma that only a whole can really exist and that which is a part in intention cannot have independent existence the essence of neo-realism the object's independence of our apprehension of it as developed by professor perry 
would be utterly impossible on a nominalistic metaphysics, and so would Professor Spaulding's doctrine of analytic realism. At any rate, it is a significant fact that the one positive doctrine which all the six authors find themselves compelled to use in their arguments is the non-mental character of the propositions of logic and mathematics. There is, to be sure, a certain hesitation in the author's repudiation of nominalism. While in general they accord full ontological status to things of thought, logical and mathematical entities are denied the claim to existence, but are put in the undefined but spacious realm of subsistence. I cannot, however, but regard the distinction between existence and subsistence, which the authors have borrowed from Russell, as merely a temporary or provisional makeshift. Certain sensible or physical terms in time and space are regarded as existence, and all other possible or impossible objects of thought are subsistence. This, like most dichotomous divisions, can hardly be expected to be of much use, for it puts too many things in the negative class, in this case, the class of subsistence. The question is important because the facile division of objects into existent and subsistent tends to obscure the fundamental problem or requirement of any constructive philosophy, viz. a systematic classification of reals, or doctrine of categories. To the neglect of this problem may be ascribed a great deal of the misunderstanding and futility of modern philosophic controversy. The distinction between existence and subsistence arises from a certain requirement in the modern philosophy of mathematics, viz. that mathematical propositions shall have a meaning which is non-psychologic and non-physical. Russell expresses this fact by saying that mathematical entities must be non-mental and non-existential, hence the term subsistence to cover those entities. The restriction, however, of the term existence to sensible objects, which this terminology implies, leads to considerable confusion in the neo-realist philosophy. Footnote. Russell says, except space and time themselves, only those objects exist which have to particular points of space and time the special relation of occupying them. I take it that Russell means to predicate existence of those things only which occupy both space and time, so that things occupying time only, e.g. misunderstandings of realism, do not exist. Moreover, in the light of other utterances, Russell probably means that only points of space and time exist, but that series denoted by the terms time and space, like existence itself, do not exist. End footnote. Russell's statement repeated by Marvin that the non-existential character of mathematics is one of the greatest discoveries of the 19th century is, of course, true. But what it means is simply that mathematical propositions are formal, and their truth is independent of the truths of physics. Mathematical entities, then, are not physical, but they certainly have being as much as physical entities do. What reason can there be, outside of a nominalistic metaphysics, for denying the existence of one and not of the other? Moreover, the restriction of the existential predicate to sensible terms gives rise to confusion in the realm where the distinction between existence and subsistence first arose, viz. mathematics. When a mathematician proves an existence theorem, e.g. that every equation of the nth degree has n roots, he surely establishes something more than the subsistence of these n roots. For the n plus fourth root of the same equation has, according to the neo-realist canon, subsistence though demonstrably no existence. The difference here raised does not seem to be sufficiently met by Russell's contention that mathematical existence denotes something totally, i.e. generically, different from physical existence. For if mathematical existence is only a kind of subsistence, it is surely of the utmost importance to distinguish between the subsistence of the nth root and the subsistence of the n plus fourth root. Instead, then, of inquiring into the kinds of existence, we have to inquire into the kinds or grades of subsistence. Is it true, however, that mathematical and physical existences are so generically different that they have nothing in common? For one thing, the determination of physical existence is frequently, if not always, based on mathematical existence. Moreover, the manner in which mathematical and physical existences are determined is exactly the same. Take the questions, is there a root to every equation? Is there a maximum velocity in the physical universe? Is there a special sex-determining factor in the germ cell? Did Moses have a real historical existence? 
Now in all these significant questions, the existence or non-existence of the entities in question is determined, in their respective sciences, not by reference to the question whether they are mental, but by reference to their relation to the body of propositions which form the sciences in question. What reason can there be, on realistic ground, for saying that roots and velocities have no existence, but that the other entities do? Does it not seem that what we need is a fuller account of the different levels or types of existence? This question of the distinction between existence and subsistence is an illustration of the truth of the author's contention that care in the use of words is really important. An adequate doctrine of categories would do away with a great many of the difficulties which Montague, for instance, finds in the existence of error and hallucinatory objects. This does not hold of Holt's theory. Errors and false propositions do undoubtedly exist in this world if anything does. The significant question is how do they exist, i.e. to what type of existence do they belong? Many people, for instance, will find unconvincing Spaulding's arguments for the existence of points in space, or of atoms in material bodies, and will find good reasons for their unbelief. This situation arises from the fact that points are non-spatial, i.e. non-extended, and atoms non-material, i.e. devoid of the ordinary properties of matter. Points and atoms then do not have the kind of existence of space and matter. And unless this distinction is clearly recognized, both the affirmative and the negative positions seem equally tenable or untenable. In the light of a developed doctrine of categories, also the distinction between discovery and invention, between finding and making, which dominates neo-realism in its present stage, may turn out not to be as thoroughgoing as it appears in the light of current controversy. The distinction in question is certainly valid for a great many types of reality. There is a real logical opposition between discovering and inventing a polar continent. But did the Romans invent or discover their jurisprudence? Did the authors of this book invent or discover the neo-realist philosophy? These questions suggest the possibility of a realm where invention and discovery overlap, or cease to be clearly antithetic terms. The author's own statement of the historical significance of neo-realism seems rather unfortunate. The account in question reads too much like an Hegelian a priori history, with its distinct stages, each by a dialectic process giving rise to its successor. I regard it as unfortunate because it is not likely to discourage critics from dealing with neo-realism as a new epistemology, whereas it is really a return to a mode of thought in which the epistemologic specter need not trouble us. Take, for instance, the theory of error. The authors, and their critics like Professor Lovejoy, assume that the first method of explaining error is by the introduction of mind or consciousness. That, however, is not the fact. For this action of consciousness as a disturbing medium seems to have been suggested by the modern use of lenses. The earlier attempt to explain error, found alike among the Hindus and Greek philosophers, is to give error a kind of secondary or shadowy existence of its own. Maya is not due merely to consciousness, but is a sort of maze or fog which surrounds the real, and the way of error in Parmenides is certainly not the way of consciousness. The neo-realist doctrine of error, as briefly indicated by the essays of Holt and Pitkin, will in fact be found to begin where the Greeks left off, and to develop the ancient method in a form consonant with the requirements of modern science. The one modern movement with which neo-realism is closely allied, in motive at least, is radical empiricism. James was profoundly dissatisfied with the prevailing nominalism and saw that it must logically lead to a hopeless and lifeless atomism. James tried to restore in philosophy the fluency of things by giving relations, transitions, etc., a psychologic status. Neorealism aims at the same results, but turns its back on any attempt to construct the world out of psychologic states. In the light of modern mathematical research, it returns to the Aristotelian insight that what is prior in knowledge need not be prior in nature, and thus reopens the path of progress along which all the objective sciences have been going, but which has been shut to philosophy by the specters of epistemology. Section 2. 
The logical and historical introduction to neo realism is to be found in Professor Marvin's essay on the emancipation of metaphysics from epistemology. The neo realist movement is a quote, reaction against the whole enterprise of Locke, Kant, and their followers to get a fundamental science, and not merely against their idealism. Neo realism is not only a different theory of knowledge, but what is more important for metaphysics, a different doctrine as to the place of epistemology in the hierarchy of the sciences. End quote. Professor Marvin does well to thus refer to Locke as the father of criticism. For Kant's boastful claim often makes us forget that it was Locke who first set in fashion the view that we must examine the nature of knowledge before, quote, we let loose our thoughts into the vast ocean of being, end quote. Professor Marvin's attack, however, is directed more particularly against the Kantian view of an a priori science of knowledge as the necessary prerequisite for metaphysics. To offset epithet criticism, Professor Marvin adopts the admirable device of calling his position dogmatism and opposing it to criticism. Kant's assumption of the possibility of a science or critique which can determine a priori the nature, possibility, and limits of knowledge is really untenable. For epistemology can function only if it assumes that we already are in possession of valid knowledge. And this knowledge, as a matter of fact, it borrows from logic, psychology, etc. The possibility of mathematics, physics, or metaphysics is far less questionable than the possibility of epistemology. The neo-Kantian may reply, of course, we must assume that we are in possession of valid knowledge in order to proceed at all. But Kant never supposes that the validity of science is in need of proof. The significant question for him is, what are the conditions which make valid knowledge possible? To which we may answer, that this way of putting the question is inconsistent with the claim of epistemology as an a priori science more fundamental than metaphysics or psychology, for the actual conditions of valid knowledge can be determined only on the basis of logical, psychological, or metaphysical data. Indeed, Kant himself really does assume a particular system of psychology, of various faculties, and certain definite views of reality in order to work out his deductions of the categories and other parts of his critique of pure reason. This Kantian metaphysics may be valid. What Professor Marvin is intent on proving is that it does not follow from, but on the contrary is the basis of Kant's epistemology. The same may be said of the neo-Hegelian metaphysics of Green and his followers, which they claim rests on an examination of the nature of knowledge. The history of science shows no important scientific advance or metaphysical progress due to epistemology. On the contrary, whatever influence the latter has exerted on the former seems to have been pernicious. The various sciences and metaphysics therefore are, and by right ought to be, free and independent of the sovereignty of epistemology, and they may go on to develop their fields without waiting for the issue of a permit by the science of epistemology. This, I take it, is the gist of Professor Marvin's careful and most conscientiously worked out argument. It seems so cogent and unanswerable that it arouses a very distressing reflection. Why has philosophy so long failed to note this? Professor Marvin's argument has been, in part at least, made by such different writers as Hegel and the Frisian school. But the intellectual world, without stopping to refute these arguments, has calmly ignored them. Even the positive sciences now feel it incumbent upon them to pay their respects to Erkenntnis theory, while metaphysics is considered as belonging to the intellectual underworld. Nay, even Professor Marvin himself subscribes to the statement of his colleagues that the epistemologic question, quote, is prior to all other philosophic issues, end quote. Perhaps, however, the line between neorealism and criticism is not as sharp as Professor Marvin draws it. What Kant calls transcendental method is not very much different in essence from that which Marvin calls logical analysis, and which he maintains is independent of psychology. The more fundamental difference, I venture to think, lies elsewhere, viz. in the conception of the realm of metaphysics. Kant's metaphysics is essentially anti-evolutionary, a priori, and incapable of progress. Pure speculative reason, he tells us, is able to give a complete enumeration of the possible modes of proposing problems to itself, and thus sketch out the entire system of metaphysics. 
And again, metaphysics, by means of criticism, quote, can take in the whole sphere of its cognitions and can thus complete its work and leave it for the use of posterity as a capital which can never receive fresh accessions, End quote. If we no longer believe reality to be such a closed and limited system, then we must give up the attempt to deduce it a priori and complete from the nature of knowledge as such. This anti-evolutionary view in the background of criticism explains why the most blighting effects of criticism have been felt by such young growing sciences as sociology and jurisprudence. Workers in these fields are distracted at the outset by purely formal problems, as what is the nature of social science? its method, its object, its limits, etc., etc. But there is no way of finding the limits of a science except by actually developing it first. Epistemologic criticism is applicable to science only when the latter is in a state of relative completion, e.g., in certain fields of mathematics and physics. Then questions of procedure, the convenience of hypotheses, etc., have a definite meaning but such considerations must follow and cannot precede the constructive stage. The elimination of critical epistemology leaves the field clear for constructive metaphysics. Now, unlike most recent philosophic procedures, neorealism takes modern physical science seriously, or, if you please, naively. It does not regard it as a mere construction of the mind, a more or less useful falsehood, but as a valid method of discovering the constitution of reality. Hence, in adopting the mathematical or analytic method of science, as also valid for philosophy, neorealism finds itself under the guns of men like Bradley and Bergson, who deny that analysis can enable us to reach ultimate reality and insist that it must necessarily falsify the real. Hence the need for Spaulding's essay, A Defense of Analytics, quote, as a method of knowing which discovers entities or parts which are real in quite the same way as are the wholes which are analyzed, unquote. the neorealist is quite willing to admit that the actual analyses which men make are selected from a larger number of possible ones. But this does not prove that they are falsifications. If there are more parts or further divisions than those employed in our analysis, it does not follow that our analysis is false. It may be true as far as it goes. As the opponents of analysis do themselves employ analysis in their attempt to prove their contention, it is at least doubtful whether all analysis can be false qua analysis. Professor Spaulding therefore examines in detail the various types of analysis, viz. that of aggregates, classes, and organic unities, and shows that in each case the objections are invalid. An aggregate is analyzed by enumeration, i.e. by naming the parts and the conjunctive relation. Why is this falsification? Because, says Bergson, there is no genuine plurality in nature itself, but all things interpenetrate. This assumption, however, of a universal interpenetration is a mere snap judgment or violent generalization without adequate evidence. Any evidence for interaction must, of course, begin by recognizing different things which interact. Under the analysis of classes, Spaulding includes the analysis of number, space, time, motion, velocity, and acceleration, and such classes of individuals as atoms, electrons, etc. The attack on this kind of analysis is stated by Bergson in a form the logic of which is identical with that of Zeno's attack on motion. According to this attack, analysis breaks up space into non-extended points, time into unenduring moments, and motion into a series of rests. But these supposed parts are the contradictions of the given wholes. Therefore is analysis falsification, to which Professor Spaulding justly replies that this attack ignores and misstates the actual results of modern analysis. The divisibility of continuous space does not lead to discreteness, but on the contrary defines definitely what is meant by continuity. And in the same way, it is not true that modern analysis resolves motion into a series of rests. In its account of analysis, this attack leaves out the organizing relations. While points, for example, are non-extended, there is no contradiction in saying that space is a class of points between which certain relations hold. Quote, Consider both terms and relations and the properties of the whole which may be left over, but which are revealed by analysis 
and the analysis becomes adequate at the same time that there is opportunity for that creative evolution, for that creative synthesis which some of the attacking party emphasize so strongly, but which is not dependent for its acceptance upon the validity of the attack. End quote. Organic unities are distinguished by the fact that they are wholes possessing properties which are not the sum of the properties of the parts. This, however, is not confined, as is usually supposed, to organisms. There are some qualities in a compound like water which cannot be obtained by adding the qualities of the components. But whether the parts modify each other when united, or whether new organizing relations arise when the parts are united as they were not before, in either case scientific analysis or synthesis is adequate to reveal the real change in nature. The introduction of entelechies to distinguish organisms from inorganic physico-chemical complexes is either scientifically pernicious or unnecessary. According to whether the entelechies do or do not introduce an element of indeterminism, a supervening awareness may occur, and, quote, it is good realism to admit that it may, unquote, but it cannot be used as a principle of explanation. The attack on conceptual analysis as conceptional is based on the argument that concepts are necessarily static and inadequate to grasp change or process. But why assume that only like entities can be related? The concept of divisibility need not be divisible. At any rate, there is no real contradiction in a definite or fixed concept of a flow, and Bergson himself uses concepts to denote the three kinds of change. In this connection, Professor Spaulding briefly indicates four important characteristics of concepts, or states of affairs. These will well bear more extensive development in a future paper. It must be conceded, I think, that Professor Spaulding's very laborious arguments show the utter flimsiness of the attack on analysis, so far as the latter is based on the argument that analysis of space, time, or motion leads to contradiction. This last argument simply ignores the fact that modern mathematics, by its analysis of infinity and continuity, has definitively solved Zeno's puzzles. Besides, the charge of contradiction comes with bad grace from those who are skeptical about the force of logical contradiction when it is applied to their own doctrines. Nevertheless, there is an element of real force in the contention that analysis is by itself inadequate to give us a complete account of space, time, and motion, and that resort to intuition is necessary. Mathematical analysis can reveal to us only the formal or structural properties of such entities as space. Having started with a number of postulates relating to indefinable points, the properties deduced will be the same if these points are numbers, ideal citizens of an ideal commonwealth, or whatnot, so long as the defining relations hold between them. What distinguishes physical space from any other possible interpretation of S, mathematical space, can therefore be grasped only by intuition. Spaulding's statement following Russell that points are spatial is hardly warranted by his own analysis, in which points are necessarily, not probably, indefinable. Professor Spaulding also seems to forget that space is not determined solely as a point collection. It may also be constituted in diverse other ways, e.g. as a four-dimensional collection of lines, in which the lines are the simple elements and points complexes formed by the intersection of lines. This, of course, in no way militates against the validity of any of these analyses of space. The same thing may be correctly expressed in different sets of units without damage to realism. But reflection on these considerations enables one to understand some of the motives of those to whom the world appears more fluid than to Professor Spaulding. Indeed, there is a hard and fast finality about some of the latter statements which is hardly warranted by the present state of science. E.g., the statement that points presuppose numbers is certainly not true if we restrict ourselves to projective geometry. In his realistic zeal, also Professor Spaulding seems to me to obliterate the distinction between hypothesis and fact, as in his argument for the reality of atoms. It is well to take science seriously, but why should philosophers be compelled to take scientific hypotheses more seriously than scientists themselves do? Why pin the hope of our salvation on atoms when leading chemists like Ostwald, Duhem, and others can get along without them? Moreover, many scientists who profess their allegiance to the atomic hypothesis do so merely as a matter of form. Take any textbook on crystallography, on the phase rule, or on any branch of thermodynamics. 
you may find a good deal said at the beginning about the atomic constitution of matter but when the real work begins all that is silently disregarded and integration formulae are introduced which presuppose the continuity of matter indeed the attitude of most working scientists today to the atomic theory or other regnant theories is very much like that of the mexican governor who is reputed to have said i owe allegiance to whatever brigand is duly elected president but first of all i must maintain order in my own province whatever objections may be brought against this view it at least saves us from the extremes of anarchy and vicious absolutism professor perry's essay a realistic theory of independence is a painstaking attempt to define the distinctive epistemological doctrine of neo-realism the new realism differs from the old realism of reed in giving up the doctrine of a substance behind the qualities i am not sure whether professor montague always does so its distinctive note is that the object is independent of the knower what does this mean it does not mean we are told the absence of any relation between the object and our knowledge nor does the neo-realist even wish to deny that knowledge may be in some sense prior to the object by the term independent we are to understand simply the absence of certain specific relations which constitute dependence Quote, in order to prove the dependence of a on b it is necessary to show that a contains b or that a is the cause or effect of b in a system which exclusively determines a or that a implies b or that a is implied exclusively by b to exhibit any relation of a to b other than these is beside the point whether a and b be otherwise related or not does not affect the independence of a End quote. it is clear that with this definition of dependence our opponent will never be able to prove the dependence of the object on consciousness for if it can be shown that the object is in any way determined by something else it can no longer be said to be exclusively determined by consciousness and is therefore independent on the other hand so far as this definition goes one may believe that consciousness modifies every real and yet maintain that the latter is independent of the former which would make it seem as if the chief novelty of neo-realism on this point is the use of the word independent in an unusual sense indeed the proposed definition of independence is not only somewhat unusual but even directly contrary to popular use which conceives what is included implied caused or explained as the dependent term rather than that which contains implies causes or explains certainly a use of the term dependence which makes the premise of a syllogism depend on the conclusion involves some violence to ordinary usage the neo-realist of course has a perfect right to define his terms in any way he pleases but as he cannot change the flavor which words carry along with them some confusion is bound to result the really vital point of professor perry's argument however consists in the elimination of the egocentric predicament by showing that the ubiquity of the knowledge relation is irrelevant to the determination of the real indeed scientific procedure depends on this variability to show that a condition may be irrelevant even though it is always present Quote, it is the task of science to distinguish within a total manifold those factors which do count and those which do not End quote. thus e g the equality of the ratios between the sides of a triangle and the sines of the opposite angles is discovered in a larger context containing among other things the absolute magnitude of the sides but though present the absolute magnitude does not count similarly quote, when galileo discovered that acceleration was a function of the time of a body's fall he discovered that it was not a function of the body's weight or volume and to establish this it was not necessary for him to obtain an instance of a body without weight or volume it was sufficient for him to show that the factors although present did not enter into the calculation End quote. from this it clearly follows that an object may enter into or go out of the cognitive situation without losing its independence in the concluding portion of his essay professor perry examines various cases of subjectivity and concludes that the whole realm of value art history society life etc is dependent on consciousness though independent of reflective or secondary conscious relations with which it may enter this admission or qualification may minimize the issue between realism and idealism but the critical onlooker may well ask whether it does not prejudice the argument in the earlier portion of the essay where is the difference in point of objectivity or independence between a proposition of mathematics and one of economics 
Many judgments of value are purely logical or mathematical. The test is laid down that, quote, insofar as any given object is deducible otherwise than from consciousness, it is independent of consciousness, end quote. And from this it is argued that if the mean velocity of Jupiter can be deduced from the gravitational system without reference to cognition, it must be considered independent of the latter. But is not the economic value of a thing in the same way determined? Not by reference to cognition, but by its quality, quantity, cost of production, etc. It would be a pity if Professor Perry's view that judgments of value have not the same objectivity as judgments of mathematics or logic were to lead to the view that neorealism has no message for ethics or philosophy of life. To at least one reader of this volume, the great promise of neorealism is precisely in the latter direction. The great confusion and futility of social theory today seems to me to result from the attempt to build up a social philosophy on a nominalistic logic. Nominalistic logic must inevitably lead to atomistic individualism and to a psychology of moments or states, as can be seen in the history of ethics from Antisthenes to Bentham or Spencer. By emphasizing the reality of universals or organizing relations, by recognizing the latter as real causes, neorealism supplies a much-needed aid to the analysis of the larger life. Professor Perry and his colleagues frequently speak of absolute simples. It is worthwhile raising the issue whether there are such things. The argument is advanced that analysis, i.e. the recognition of complexes, presupposes the existence of simples. But obviously, this simplicity is always relative to a specified complex. In another context, this simple term may itself be very complex. Smith may be a simple unit for purposes of vital statistics, but infinitely complex to his teacher, business partner, or sweetheart. A point is a simple entity in our ordinary three-dimensional space, but a complex in line geometry. And so atoms, electrons, the color green, etc., are simples in certain contexts, and complex in others. Even logical ideas like implication, disjunction, negation, etc., can be simple ideas in one system and complex in another. Compare the indefinables of Russell's Principles of Mathematics to those of the Principia Mathematica. The foregoing three essays may be considered as an attempt to clear the ground and indicate the method for a constructive metaphysics. Thus considered, they represent the necessary common ground for the six writers. The remaining three essays are devoted to a special problem, which arises on this common ground, viz. the nature of consciousness and error. As the solutions which Professors Montague, Holt, and Pitkin offer differ from each other, and as in the present temper of philosophic discussion this topic is certain to receive more than its due share of attention, it is not necessary to review it here in detail. In his suggestive essay, A Realistic Theory of Truth and Error, Professor Montague approaches the problem from a modified form of his theory, which identifies consciousness with potential energy. Consciousness consists of the self-transcending implications which the brain states sustain to their extra-organic causes or effects. Quote, now if we single out some one event and inquire as to its cause, we shall find a plurality of possible antecedents, any one of which, if it had not been counteracted, would have produced it. It follows from this that the implicate or conscious object of any brain state may be, but need not be, an event which actually exists. End quote. According then, as the implicates are real things or their contradictories, we have truth or error. The anthropomorphic or common sense view of causality which this theory involves is of such limited application that Professor Montague is sure to encounter considerable trouble in convincing others of its adequacy. Professor Pitkin, for one, is convinced that implication or meaning is of much wider extent than causality, e.g. the triangle implies, in Euclidean space, a constant sum of interior angles, but the angles are neither the cause nor the effect of the triangle. It seems as if Professor Montague, the pioneer of neorealism in this country, is in danger of being considered a reactionary by his more progressive or radical brethren. Thus he refuses to accept the relational formula which would explain the real existence of an optically bent but tactually straight stick. He does not allow hallucinatory objects to invade the real world, and lapses into such traditional utterances as, quote, my awareness of objects is more certainly real than anything else, end quote and, quote, we are more certain of our own thoughts and feelings than of anything else, end quote. In spite of the fact that he clearly points out that it is not because of any character of belief, 
but quote, because of what is believed that the belief is true or false, end quote, he is not willing to accept the view that truth or falsehood are qualities of certain objects or complexes. In common with Professor Spaulding and perhaps several other of his colleagues, Professor Montague holds to the priority of empty time and space over the content which fills it. No proof is offered for this position, nor does it seem necessary for the realist position. Realism does not seem inconsistent with the view that time is the measure of motion and space a way of coordinating positions. Metaphysicians who assume an absolute time or space should at least reckon with the recent relativity theory of Einstein and Minkowski, the only theory which satisfactorily explains the Michelson-Morley experiments. According to this theory, the time interval is just as relative to the point of observation as the angle which a line subtends. Anyone who is inclined to think that realism tends in the direction of materialism will find much food for thought in Professor Montague's keen criticism of panhylism. Professor Pitkin, in stating the agreement between Professors Montague, Holt, and himself, says, quote, Whatever consciousness is, it is somehow connected with the activity of getting beyond space and time, that is, of adjusting variously to events beyond the organism's own skin and to conditions more than material. End quote. As original and constructive contributions to philosophy, quite apart from the realistic thesis, the essays of Professors Holt and Pitkin seem to me the most important in this volume. Professor Holt's remarkably well-organized attack on the theory of specific nerve energy cuts at the root of a good deal of the vain speculation which has overrun modern psychologic philosophy. And Professor Pitkin's effort at evolving a new system of categories wherewith to express our biologic experience will go far to remove the light-hearted reliance on the categories of popular biology, which are frequently nothing but the remnants of outworn metaphysical systems. Limitations of space, however, and regard for the main current which runs through all the essays make only scant treatment of them possible. Some neorealists and all their critics seem to feel that the problem of error is a crucial one for neorealism. I confess that while the problem is one of the utmost importance, I cannot see that it is peculiarly a problem for the realist any more than for anybody else, and most modern schools have dodged it. If we maintain, as any analysis of scientific procedure compels us, that a proposition is true or false not because we make it or believe it, but because of what is asserted in it, and because of the relations it bears to other propositions, then it seems to follow that truth and falsehood are equally independent of the consciousness in which they appear. At any rate, there is no evidence from science that the line between the true and the false, the real and the erroneous, is identical with that between the non-mental and the mental. The denial of the realistic position, therefore, can be made only on the basis either that all objects are mental, or that only unreal objects are of mental origin. The former does not explain the difference between the true and the false, and the latter admits the non-mental character of real objects. Be that as it may, it is a fact that the existence of non-mental but illusory objects is generally considered paradoxical. And Professor Holt's essay, The Place of Illusory Experience in a Realistic World, tries to meet the objections on this ground. The argument that in the case of an illusory object, the person sees what is not there, hence the act of seeing is constitutive of the object, is met by showing many physical processes of copying, by cameras, etc., which reproduce the same distortions or reduplications of the objects concerned. There is, therefore, every reason to suppose that the distortion or reduplication is due not to consciousness, but to the physical relation between the sense organs and the object. Thus the relativity of secondary qualities, the production of negative or complementary afterimages, etc., are paralleled by the action of thermometers, the receiving mast of a wireless telegraph system, etc., to the argument that the outside world contains only primary qualities and vibration rates, and that the secondary qualities must be aroused in the mind by specific nerve energies, Professor Holt, after thoroughly refuting the specific nerve energy theory, produces a new hypothesis which attempts to deduce the secondary qualities from the frequency interval of nerve pulses or vibration, and thus reduce them to a genuine part of the objective order. As this hypothesis will probably be seen to greater advantage in his forthcoming book on the concept of consciousness, discussion of it had better be postponed for the present. It is enough to indicate that it attempts to solve the problem of illusory objects by showing, quote, that the nervous system, even when unstimulated from without, 
is able to generate within itself nerve currents of those frequencies whose density factor is the same as an ordinary peripheral stimulation. Hence the illusory object with its secondary qualities is a genuine part of the physical system. The failure to work out clearly a theory of types or levels of existence gives the neorealist assertion in regard to the objectivity of illusory objects the appearance of self-contradiction. It seems to say that these illusory or unreal objects are true or real. Footnote, it is so misunderstood by Professor McGilvery. End footnote. The reader, however, must not interpret the argument that illusory objects are objective, non-mental, or parts of the physical world to mean that they are true or existent reals. For the neorealist does not believe that the objective is necessarily existent. It may merely have being or subsistence. Nor has the illusory object the quality of being true. In the subsistent world, all sorts of contradictory or opposite propositions are found side by side. It is only when we limit ourselves to existent entities that contradictory propositions can no longer be applicable. As thus used, the term existent covers not only physical and mental terms, but also mathematical entities whose existence is demonstrated. Of great significance is Professor Holt's criticism of Mr. G. E. Moore's view that consciousness and its objects are distinct existence, between which there is only the unresolvable relation of awareness. The latter view seems to be based on an undue emphasis on the qualitative difference between the object and idea. Thus, fire burns, but the idea of fire does not, etc. Professor Holt's answer is fire burns, but the shape of the flame does not. Surely the two are not, therefore, two distinct entities. In his essay on some realistic implications of biology, Professor Pitkin has attempted to introduce more material than can conveniently be compressed within the 90 pages at his disposal. It is to be hoped that he will soon expand this into a respectable volume, and thus perhaps render it easier for the reader. The main points which, as a result of his analysis of the biologic situation, he contributes to the realist position are 1. The organism does not always modify the stimulus. As against Professor Dewey, for instance, it is maintained that, quote, at least in some cases, the eye activity does not condition the specific light character of ether vibration, but only the distribution and employment of these, end footnote. 2. The doctrine of internal relations and what is often called the organic view of things finds no support from the facts of biology. According to the organic view, every part of an organic whole depends upon the whole, and no part can be removed without destroying the whole. The facts of experimental biology flatly disprove this, so far as natural organisms are concerned. 3. Planes, angles, numbers, ratios, and other such mathematical geometrical characters are genuine stimuli. They are thus real causes. 4. The cognitive situation can be interpreted realistically by means of a very suggestive analogy from projective geometry. Professor Pitkin thus tries to make clear, quote, how errors, illusions, and hallucinations are not made by consciousness nor are peculiar to it, but are necessary features of a projected physical system, end quote. Attempts like these to dispense with old accredited categories and to invent new descriptions which will eliminate discredited metaphysical doctrines make neorealism appear excessively technical and complex. However, if we distinguish between the familiar and the simple, may not such an attempt lead to greater simplicity? Apart from its specific doctrines, this book is bound to be influential in raising the standard of philosophic workmanship. Many, doubtless, will be offended by the somewhat scant courtesy to all previous philosophy, and the promise of reform in the introduction will be regarded by many others like a set of New Year's resolutions, pious and necessary, but of doubtful efficacy. Few, however, will deny that the authors have done their work in a genuine scientific spirit. The book contains almost no rhetoric. There is no running loose with such catchwords as experiential, functional, dynamic, etc. Problems are minutely and patiently examined for their own sake, and not simply as points in a more or less subtle apology for supposed valuable human interests, like the belief in immortality, freedom, etc. The authors in the main resist the temptation to deal with wholesale affirmations or negations. 
but insist on a careful examination of the various meanings and situations involved, thus tending to restore discrimination as a philosophic virtue. By thus submitting the things of thought to the same careful study as the things of sense receive in the physical sciences, the traditional difference between empiricism and rationalism as methods is wiped out. The neo-realism may well be called neo-rationalism or neo-empiricism, differing from the older empiricism in recognizing the immediate reality of the things of thought. Neo-realism is frankly intellectualistic, and we may expect its opponents to call it neo-scholasticism. But scholasticism of a kind has always been needed to police the intellectual realm and check the riot of anarchic mysticism. The book before us is not likely to go through twelve editions within the next year, or to receive the Nobel Prize for idealistic literature. It lacks the sweep of popular assertions, and is written with conscientious regard for qualification and detail, often most painfully so. It brings no easy solution to the riddle of the universe, and offers no text for pulpit orations, but the discerning will regard it as a notable contribution to constructive philosophy. End of The New Realism by Morris Raphael Cohen.